So, in this uh, lecture we will uh, get introductory ideas about uh, tensors. Uh, we have seen already that uh, in rheology we have to uh, understand the relations between uh, stress tensor on one hand and uh, strain tensor or the strain rate tensors. We also saw that uh, for example, to find uh, the traction at a particular point, uh, the stress tensor could be uh, used as well as the unit normal vector had to be used. So, in general we will find that uh, in course of uh, rheology we will have uh, scalars, vectors and tensors involved and uh, the governing equations are nothing but interrelations among these different variables. So, in, in this uh, uh, set of lectures uh, we will uh, first get introduced to the idea of tensors and then uh, look at some of the operations in which uh, we will use them. Uh, so, that uh, we can uh, write the governing equations uh, more compactly and then also we can seek solutions more easily. So, just to look at the outline of uh, what overall we are going to do, we will begin our discussions uh, by looking at uh, what uh, is, is meant by a frame and a coordinate system and then quickly review uh, what we know about scalars and vectors and uh, what we will see is these are tensors of uh, order 0 and 1 respectively. Uh, then uh, we will spend uh, some time uh, talking about the tensor of order 2 uh, of which stress and strain rate are examples and uh, then the important aspect of how do we denote different quantities which are involved in the governing equations. And uh, when we look at the summary of uh, notation times, then we will be ready to look at some of the example operations. So, we will first uh, review again uh, the operations with vectors uh, which we are familiar uh, from uh, uh, earlier uh, school as well as uh, initial courses in uh, undergraduate education. And then we will also summarize the operations with tensors which are especially relevant for uh, the course on rheology. Uh, we will uh, finish up uh, the overall uh, discussion on tensors uh, by summarizing some of the operations that are involved with uh, derivatives. So, with this uh, now let us begin uh, in terms of uh, what is uh, the basis for describing uh, the physical variables that are uh, part of the governing equations in uh, rheology. And uh, as we discussed earlier, we will be looking at uh, field variables which are functions of uh, space and time. And uh, so, to describe uh, the status, uh, the attributes of a material particle, uh, we will need a frame to describe that. And uh, by frame, we need uh, it is a, it's a uh, frame of reference and uh, by that uh, what we mean is uh, the uh, the basis of the reference point from where we view the overall uh, deformation phenomenon that is uh, occurring in the material. Uh, quite often when we say we have chosen a frame we are basically defining sort of the origin of uh, the viewpoint and uh, also how does the origin change uh, or remain static as a function of time. So, that basically specifies what is the frame in which uh, we are going to observe the phenomenon. Uh, once we have decided the frame uh, then to quantify uh, the spatial uh, uh, coordinates, uh, what we do is we have a coordinate system which then describes uh, the matrix uh, in the frame. So, uh, of course, most uh, commonly we will be dealing with uh, three dimensional uh, uh, space and therefore, we have the coordinate axes and the base vectors which are integral part of defining a coordinate systems. Since it is a three dimensional uh, coordinate system, we have basically three coordinate axes or three base vectors. Uh, more often than not these base vectors are uh, unit vectors and they are orthogonal to each other. But in general when we say that there is a coordinate system that can be used to describe uh, quantitatively uh, a frame. Then uh, we have several options uh, in terms of choosing the coordinate system. So, for example, the most general development in uh, continuum mechanics uh, and uh, also in other fields of mechanics is done in terms of uh, generalized coordinates. In uh, which case we basically work with uh, the uh, fundamental hypothesis that to describe three dimensional space we need three coordinates and three base vectors we do not assign any other particular property uh, 
to these particular uh, quantities. Only thing that is required is these are three independent uh, coordinates and three independent base vectors. So, any linear combinations of these can be used to describe the physical space effectively. And uh, for engineering problems and uh, as well as many other uh, scientific problems of interest, uh, we have a geometry in mind, we have a typical uh, uh, configuration uh, of the material which we are interested in uh, looking at and therefore, more often than not we either look at a rectangular coordinate system, a cylindrical coordinate system or a spherical coordinate system. In each of these cases, uh, we know very well that uh, uh, the three uh, orthogonal unit vectors are actually the basis uh, of these coordinate systems. And of course, in each and every case we have three coordinate axes uh, x, y, z for example, in case of rectangular or r theta phi in case of uh, spherical. So, these three coordinates and uh, of course, uh, they are the three unit vectors are used to describe uh, any other uh, features associated uh, with uh, material that is being described in these coordinate systems. So, generally given uh, a frame of reference and given a coordinate system of choice, then we can write down uh, the governing equations in more detail. Uh, as we have already said that these governing equations will be uh, involving field variables. Uh, one aspect uh, of uh, uh, physical intuition uh, that uh, we have when we write these governing equations uh, is the fact that uh, the response of the material or uh, the result uh, or the analysis that we are doing and the results that we are obtaining should not depend on what is the frame that we have chosen. So, the uh, material response should not be a function of uh, how it is being described. So, that is called frame invariance and then therefore, uh, there are multiple frames in which we can describe a problem and uh, we should get identical uh, response. And uh, similarly, we also say that uh, we expect the uh, material objectivity to be observed and uh, that is again saying the same thing that even if there are different frames in which uh, the material response is being described. Uh, the uh, material objectivity implies that uh, there is the material response is same in uh, all the frames. Uh, in uh, for the purpose of our course, uh, many times we will we can also use just different coordinate system and uh, expect that uh, the overall response to be the same. So, for the purpose of argument, uh, we can either choose two different frames. For example, a frame uh, in which uh, there is a rotating table and we are observing something while rotating or it could be a stationary frame where we are standing outside and something else is happening on a rotating table. So, for example, what is happening on a rotating table can be viewed from these two different frames. Uh, we could also just look at two different coordinate systems. So, therefore, we have a, a rectangular coordinate system or a spherical coordinate system to describe a, a problem. Uh, because uh, there may not be a natural choice in terms of either uh, rectangular or spherical coordinate system to choose. But the expectation uh, uh, that we have is the material response will be independent of uh, these choices. And uh, so, the, this important uh, expectation is uh, behind a uh, uh, lot of development in terms of what specific governing equations do we use, because we would like the governing equations as well as the uh, uh, constitutive relations that we use later on in the course, they all have to be frame invariant or they have to follow the uh, principle of material objectivity. Uh, one aside note that uh, at this point is helpful to remember that uh, the mathematical tools of tensor algebra, uh, calculus and mechanics uh, were developed actually simultaneously. So, so, these expectations that uh, we talk about in terms of frame invariance or material objectivity or uh, these description in terms of different coordinate uh, frames and uh, generalized coordinates and the derivatives with respect to many of these field variables. So, all of these things uh, came about simultaneously because to describe many of the natural phenomena, these mathematical tools were required. And because the use of mathematical tools uh, corresponded well with uh, what was observed physically, uh, we, we could formulate the governing equations uh, very on a very general basis. So, similarly the idea of tensors and uh, the tensor algebra also arose because uh, 
while uh, people were analyzing problems related to mechanics, uh, it became clear that there are certain physical variables that do not uh, fit the uh, notions of variables that was known then for example, either scalars or vectors. So, therefore, clearly a new mathematical uh, set of tools were required to actually describe the quantities uh, that were involved in uh, mechanics. So, with this uh, introduction to frame and coordinate system, uh, now let us look at uh, tensors more specifically. Uh, so, in an important aspect of uh, tensors is that the, these are necessarily describing physical variables. So, we will use them in continuum mechanics and they will be involved in governing equations. By this we also mean that uh, the tensors are not necessarily just a collection of numbers. So, for example, if we write a 3 by 3 matrix and uh, a matrix itself has uh, if it is a 3 by 3 it has 9 uh, elements and those 9 elements actually can have uh, any arbitrary number and therefore, that is a matrix. But when we say we are describing a tensor we have a specific physical meaning to all the components that are there for a tensor and uh, therefore, the components will have a certain relationship with each other they, they ought to since they are representing a physical reality. Uh, we will see that there are certain rules that uh, these tensors will have to obey and, and therefore, we are only describing physical variables using these tensors. And since we are uh, describing physical variables, uh, quite often we will also uh, know that uh, we physical variables have certain magnitude or there may be some invariants associated with a physical variable. And this is because as we saw earlier that uh, there is frame invariance or material objectivity. So, clearly the physical variables which are being described in different frames or different coordinates ought to also have certain invariance. And uh, so, generally a, a tensor of order n uh, basically will have uh, the number of components of this tensor will depend on the number of dimensions. And uh, for most uh, physical systems we have of course, 3 dimensional. So, d is 3. So, given this fact uh, what we have is the components of tensor of order n will have basically t i j k and uh, the number of indices will be uh, all the way up to n. So, for example, if we have tensor of order 3 then we have i j k, if we have tensor of order 4 then we will have i j k l. So, basically this implies that uh, the number of indices in the components of a tensor will depend on its order. And of course, each of the index that we are using and we will see that we will call these i j k all uh, dummy indices. So, these i j k values will vary from 1 to, to 3 because we are talking about a 3 dimensional space. So, basically this is uh, what a tensor is, a uh, tensor is a collection of these components and uh, the number of components depend on what is the order of the tensor. And uh, a key expectation that we will uh, work with is that uh, when we change a frame or a coordinate system this tensor gets transformed and by that we mean is the components individual components may change. However, we expect that there will be certain invariants or norms or magnitudes that will remain the same even if the tensor is getting transformed. So, we will define in each and every case what is meant by the invariance of a tensor. So, with this uh, brief uh, outline now let us look at uh, the simplest tensor we know which is uh, tensor of order 0 and uh, since in this case uh, there are no indices uh, the order is 0 itself and so the number of components uh, basically is just 1. And, uh, so, in another coordinate system or another frame when we transform uh, the quantity can be represented as t prime let us say and of course, we know given the scalar that it is a scalar quantity that t and t prime are the same. In other words, even if we change a frame or coordinate system uh, the quantity does not change and of course, we know that uh, the example variables of this are uh, density, uh, temperature and uh, 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 specific heat and these variables uh, do not change whenever we have a change in coordinate system. So, going on to the next uh, uh, tensor that we very are very well aware of uh, is a vector quantity. 
So, now uh, vector is nothing but a tensor of order 1. So, which means we have only one index which will describe the number of components. So, since i is 1, 2, 3, we basically have 3 components of a tensor of order 1 and we call in this in common parlance as vector. Uh, we denote uh, the tensors and vector quantities in what is called a bold face notation or it is also called a vector notation and uh, therefore, uh, a vector a t will be indo indicated as a bold face t. And uh, of course, since we have talked about that the fact that we expect the vectors to transform from one coordinate to another coordinate system, in another coordinate system the components of t will become t i prime. Again meaning that there are 3 components, but the 3 components may not be the same as what these components were in this coordinate system. And uh, in vector notation the tensor again in another coordinate system can be indicated as t prime. And uh, we know that uh, we can define a magnitude of a vector and uh, we also know that this magnitude does not change even if we describe the vector using 2 or 3 or any number of coordinate systems. So, a uh, way of saying that is the fact that magnitude of A or the norm of uh, T and similarly norm or magnitude of T prime is same. So, regardless of the coordinate transformation that takes place this norm that we define or the magnitude that we define is an invariant. So, the invariance of a vector quantity is nothing but this magnitude and of course, there are uh, multiple ways in which we can define the norm and the most common uh, definition of the invariant is uh, summation of uh, square of uh, the components of the vector. So, in uh, summary what we have is t 1 squared plus t 2 squared plus t 3 squared and square root. So, this is the magnitude of the vector and since we know that uh, the it is invariant we would also expect that we have basically in one uh, coordinate system t 1 squared plus t 2 squared plus t 3 squared to the power half and uh, when we express it in another coordinate system we have t 1 prime squared plus t 2 prime squared plus t 3 prime squared and again to the power half. So, therefore, we have uh, the expectation uh, that uh, this magnitude remains constant and uh, which is what is expressed in this relationship here. So, therefore, you can find this uh, magnitude using uh, the definition and uh, example variables in this case are uh, velocity and force and electric field and uh, these variables uh, have been used in variety of uh, problems related to mechanics. So, now we go on we have looked at uh, tensors of order 0 which we have uh, always known as scalar quantity and the tensor of order 1 which we have known as uh, vector quantity. Now, we can go ahead and start looking at uh, tensors of order 2. Uh, the tensor of order 2 in uh, most common uh, language is basically referred to as just tensor. So, we generally refer to tensors of order 0, 1 and 2 as scalar, vector and tensor respectively. So, given that uh, the tensor of order 2 has uh, 2 indices, so T i j and uh, both i and j will be 1, 2 and 3. So, therefore, we have uh, basically 9 components. So, given we have uh, T i j and given that i goes from 1, 2, 3 and j goes from 1, 2, 3, what we have is T 1, 1 t 1 2, t 1 3 and so on, t 2 1, t 2 2, t 2 3 and uh, the last 3 set of components. So, what you can see is uh, the fact that uh, basically the uh, tensor of order 2 has uh, 9 components. And of course, we can ascribe uh, 
uh, one of them as a row vector and one of them as a column vector. So, generally the matrix notation which we use to describe uh, other quantities can also be used to describe uh, the tensor of order 2 and uh, therefore, uh, what we have is a description of tensor uh, in uh, matrix notation and uh, so that just has 9 components written as rows and columns. Similar to this of course, uh, we can write a vector quantity also as a column or a row vector. So, we could write T 1, T 2, T 3 as a column vector. So, which is a, a 3 rows, but only 1 column. Alternately, we can also write this as a T 1 prime, T 2 prime or T 3 prime. In this case, there is only 1 row, but 3 columns. So, therefore, uh, we can use matrix notations to describe and write down some of these quantities, but we should remember always that tensors are describing physical variables and we should keep that in mind while uh, looking at the properties of tensors. So, in uh, given that there are 9 components of these uh, tensors in a vector or tensor notation we describe or the bold face notation the tensor is you again given as just bold face. So, as you see both vectors and tensors or uh, both tensors of order 1 and 2 are indicated using just bold type face. So, from the context and from the variables that we are dealing with uh, we will uh, know whether it is a vector or a tensor. From a notation point of view in bold face notation both of them are type face bold. Uh, when we express this uh, same tensor in another coordinate uh, system then of course, the components will not be uh, identical to what they were here. So, we can indicate again that uh, the components are same uh, the 9 components can be described using T prime i j and in tensor notation the uh, tensor can be described as T prime. So, now uh, just the way we had with vectors when we transform a tensor quantity T to another coordinate system T prime we expect that uh, there will be certain invariants which we can define and uh, these will not change uh, when you describe the tensor quantity in different coordinate system. So, therefore, uh, the invariants can be defined uh, for uh, this particular tensor on the basis of the characteristic equation as eigenvalues. So, we know the uh, governing equation to find the eigenvalues and so, T minus lambda i where uh, lambda is the uh, eigenvalue and uh, T prime minus lambda i both of these will give us the same because these are invariants. And we know that this equation when we write it down it is a cubic equation. So, therefore, there are 3 roots and therefore, we have lambda 1, lambda 2 and lambda 3 as 3 eigenvalues or the 3 invariants of a tensor. So, using these uh, eigenvalues we can of course, construct many other uh, uh, invariants. For example, uh, we could combine these uh, lambdas which are the eigenvalues of the system uh, as uh, different combinations. We could say lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 and this will again be an invariant. We could also combine them by product which is another way of uh, combining them. So, this is also another invariant or we can also have their product. So, these are again uh, invariants of the tensor. So, therefore, uh, we have several examples especially in the course related uh, on rheology that uh, are uh, tensor and we have already seen that uh, stresses because we have the direction of the force as well as the surface on which it is acting because it is a contact force stress tensor is one example. Strain again is another example because material particles have a relative displacement which is a vector and then uh, this relative displacement can happen in 3 different directions. So, therefore, there is a displacement uh, gradient which is again a tensor quantity and uh, similarly we have a rate of deformation described as a velocity gradient or strain rate and in this case again we have 3 directions of uh, motion in terms of velocity and again the velocity can change in 3 different directions. So, therefore, we have uh, again 9 components. So, each of the uh, 
tensor uh, stress strain or strain rate have 9 components. And so, the invariance of a tensor uh, as uh, we saw can be uh, written in terms of uh, the uh, eigenvalues. So, these are invariants of tensor written in terms of eigenvalues. And uh, for uh, many uh, most of the tensors that we will encounter uh, in the course on rheology, we will have uh, the condition that T i j is equal to T g i, uh, which means that it is a symmetric tensor. And for symmetric tensor, uh, it can be shown that uh, all the three eigenvalues are uh, real and uh, positive and therefore, these three can be used uh, to describe the invariance of the tensor. Uh, we could also alternatively use the components uh, written here. For example, we have written uh, the uh, components uh, which are uh, for example, the components which are these uh, 9 components that we have written. So, we could also uh, write invariants in terms of these components. Invariants in terms of T i j. Uh, why are these invariants relevant uh, let us say in case of uh, rheology? Uh, we should uh, remember that uh, we will be talking about uh, stresses and uh, strain rates or strains in uh, several situations. And uh, uh, for example, one of the uh, simplistic models of uh, non-Newtonian fluids is power law fluid. And uh, in this case, uh, the viscosity depends on the strain rate. And uh, for a one dimensional simple situation, we could say that viscosity would depend on strain rate. But since we have now uh, overall engineering situation where we will have all 9 components of strain rate, now how does viscosity, which is a scalar quantity, how does it depend on strain rate? So, while describing viscosity, which is a scalar quantity as a function of uh, strain rate tensor, we have uh, a, a problem uh, in the sense that uh, strain rate tensor would depend, its components would depend on which coordinate system is being used and clearly we do not want viscosity to depend on whatever coordinate system that is being used. So, therefore, what we will do is we will use the invariance of strain rate tensor and use that as the magnitude of strain rate tensor and then say that viscosity would depend on it. So, therefore, uh, the definitions of invariance will uh, have to be considered from time to time during the course on uh, rheology. So, we will uh, have a, a more chance to look at the invariance of a tensor and uh, which invariant is useful in which context uh, will be specified as and when we encounter the situation. Uh, in solid mechanics for example, the uh, invariant uh, second invariant of stress tensor is uh, quite often used in describing the yield phenomena. Uh, similarly, the first invariant of uh, strain rate tensor is actually 0 for a incompressible fluid. So, several uh, such invariants of tensors will be encountered and will be very useful while we are uh, describing several governing equations in rheology. So, in this lecture we have seen a brief introduction on tensors. Now, in the next lecture what we will see is uh, a summary of operations that uh, will be useful uh, when we write governing equations using these quantities.